Oh, and the other person, of course, uh, uh, perhaps even more important than uh, Chico was Mum Cheryl. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. She, the, the, the role she played in Redford is, uh, is almost hard to imagine. She was such an anchor. A self-taught general. We're talking about 1970, that's a late 1970. Yeah, that'd be right. So, um, I got uh, involved in uh, working with Ross McKenna on a pie and parsley basis. And um, then I went to my first meeting with you. And uh, Gary Foley introduced me there and Gary Williams was there. Um, Co was there. And you, you and Bob Devis and Ross McKenna. Hello. In the back in the back of the church yeah. on, on uh, Botany Road. And uh, I was impressed from the word go. Well, by this time, the service was operating. And yeah. He yeah. was, I think, he was chair of the management committee. That's right. Ross McKenna, yes. Well, uh, well, the way I came into it, um, I went to the University of New South Wales at the end of 1969 to uh, prepare to start uh, law school in 1971. Uh, and um, uh, I was um, um, you know, talking a bit into the press and otherwise about uh, the sort of law school uh, I wanted to set up and stressing that it would be a sort of socially aware law school and uh, I was approached by some students from Sydney University Law School in not during 1970 before I had any students of my own and uh, they said to me well you know we've been uh, uh, hearing what you say about the sort of law school you're going to set up uh, you know you uh, we've got a proposition <laughs> that uh, you, know, you ought to be interested in. And they told me that they were in touch with some young Aboriginals in Redfern uh, who were uh, uh, very uh, concerned about the police treatment uh, in Redfern and were looking for some help from lawyers mm -hmm. to do something about it. For a very long time I'd been hoping to find a way to make contract contact with uh, Aboriginals. I'd, I'd been very heavily involved in New Guinea and uh, Indigenous people there and uh, I was felt a bit uncomfortable about the fact that I hadn't had any contact to speak of with uh, Indigenous people in Australia so I, I really jumped at this opportunity mm -hmm. when they presented it and I went out to a meeting uh, in Glebe. Um, two people I particularly clicked with were uh, uh, Paul Coe and Gary Williams. At the meeting Paul had uh, uh, told me uh, about the curfew in uh, uh, Redfern and other things that were real eye-openers to me. I had no idea of the things that were going on. Uh, and he'd uh, uh, said that, to, you know, that they'd like to get some lawyers to uh, take some cases and teach the police a lesson and, and uh, I reacted to that uh, by saying well you know the problem about that is if the lawyers just take a few cases and disappear the police will be all the harder on you afterwards uh, Gary Williams and Paul and I sort of worked uh, closely together for a while and we gradually developed this idea of a legal service uh, and uh, we brought more and more people in, they brought more and more Aboriginals in, I brought more, more lawyers in and people from the university. Uh, <coughs> this happened, uh, this started I think 
around about the middle of 1970, or probably about July or August, I think, from memory, what we did was just uh, set up uh, uh, a completely voluntary service. We had uh, uh, we had a, a council in which we got uh, um, one of the. There were some pretty impressive uh, people that you brought in, like well, Gordon Samuels, for example. Well, the reason for that was that, um, first of all, I could say, right from the beginning, we always discussed it on the basis that uh, we wanted this to be an Aboriginal community-controlled organisation. Right. Uh, and that on the basis that it was to be the Aborigines organisation, the white fellas were there to help. Yeah. And uh, there had to be a lot of us there to help for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One was there were no Aboriginal lawyers, mm -hmm. so we had to get uh, watched to supply all the legal services. Mm -hmm. The second reason was that uh, uh, I was very keen to make it a respectable organisation in the sense that it couldn't be rubbish. Nobody could say, you know, oh, these are a lot of... Uh, hobos. Hobos and so on. Uh, mm. uh, I wanted to have people on it that uh, the Commissioner of Police mm. and the uh, government and everybody would have to mm. take seriously. And, you know, we, we got together a group of people who could stare down the Commissioner of Police or the Prisons Authority or anyone else. They had to take notice of it. I remember we had four barristers on it originally. Yeah. All four of those barristers became judges. Mm. One of them became Governor of New South yeah. Wales. So uh, it, uh, it turned out to be a pretty uh, 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 valuable group. And, all, and the solicitors on it were uh, p uh, people who held office under law yeah. society. And then I brought in uh, a number of professors from the university who were interested in various ways. And uh, so that was the sort of white component. Yeah. On the other side, uh, I thought it was very important that we should try and represent the whole of the, the black mm -hmm. community. Now, there was a bit of a, a rift between the young radicals and, yeah. and the old the people. Old people and, yeah. uh, they each tended to regard the other as the problem in a way. We uh, uh, decided we'd, we'd get both groups represented on yeah. the council. Now, uh, um, there was the, the young group that uh, were around uh, Paul and Gary and mm. there was no trouble getting them represented. Right. No. But looking more abroad, uh, I remember going around and uh, recruiting uh, Faith Bandler, who uh, was famous for a role in the referendum and a very a sort of uh, acceptable figure, I guess, yeah. amongst white people at the Aboriginal. Tom Williams, who'd yep. been an old uh, battler and <laughs> right. welfare board days. And a La Perouse representative. That's right, and truly long bottom. That's of right, La both, of, both of them were La Perouse residents. And, uh, and the other person, and he, the very in, most interesting person of all in many ways, was in between these two groups, and that was Chica Dixon. Mm. He was a bit older than the young yeah. fellas, and he'd had a lot of experience in the trade union movement, uh, but uh, he was uh, he was quite a bit older than them, and uh, um, uh, I remember they. Um, um, I talked this over with Paul and Gary, and they said I ought to go and talk to him and. Uh, uh, you know, I can remember it was very much Chica sort of sizing me up and deciding <laughs> whether he approved of me. Yes. Uh, and don't uh, you what, don't you worry that uh, he was aware that the, the quality of the organisation emerging. He was uh, he was always a good mate. He'll, yeah, uh, he always called me as he did other people, comrade. And, uh, <laughs> when, uh, uh, oh, and the other person, of course, uh, uh, perhaps even more important than uh, Chica, was Mum Shirl. 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. She, the, the the role she played in Redfern is is almost hard to imagine. She was such an anchor, a self-taught general, and uh, and you know nothing had more impact on what happened in Redfern than Mum. All these young radicals, they all wanted to keep her approval. Well, she gave us her blessing and came on yeah. the council and that was a tremendously important thing. So we got this council together that was, uh, you know, had a very interesting lot of people on it, oh, both absolutely. on the black side and the white side. The thinking very much was we were trying to set up uh, um, an Aboriginal community organisation, but white people were needed to help provide the services and to help uh, uh, deal with the with the government and yeah. the police and the white establishment. But the other well, uh, uh, common thing was that we had a site and there were people off the council who came down there with their overalls on and painted the place and that's what, that's, fixed it up. Yeah, that's at the next stage when we, we got a bit of money to have some premises. We, what, what actually happened there, we were just running this show uh, on a, without any office, without any staff. Um, we, um, we had a, a, I'd written to all the uh, barristers and solicitors within reach of Sydney and asked them to put their names on a roll to give legal service and a hell of a lot uh, responded. Uh, we had people like Ross McKenna and, in the, and um, a whole group of Aboriginals who worked with him. He started to go around police stations and jails. Yeah, and he, he, became a, um, he became a tutor of Paul Coe yeah. and it was, it was uh, Paul's uh, influence I think that brought him into it first or was it yours? No, no, he, uh, I didn't do it. He, uh, right. he was already involved. I, I, mean, I think he was a fairly radical young white to start off with. I don't and, think that uh, could be doubted. <laughs> we had two bodies. We had the council, which had all the uh, big names on it and uh, was designed to, to, on the one hand to Im impress and protect the service mm -hmm. against the establishment and also to decide policy issues uh, and then we had the management committee which was headed up by Ross and had uh, young people black and white on it who were really doing the legwork yeah. and we got a bit of publicity mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, media and a woman rang up and said look I run an answering service for yeah. doctors uh, and if you can give me um, a number to pass on messages to, you can use my number as a contact point. So this was absolutely wonderful. You didn't have mobile phones in those no. days, but, no. but you did have pages, so mm. you could get a, a, a make an arrangement whereby we had somebody on roster mm. with a pager and uh, she would uh, ring the page and they'd then call in and um, get the message and send somebody to a jail or a police station mm. or wherever help was needed. But mm. at the first stage, we were doing this all on this uh, completely uh, voluntary basis, uh, everything done by volunteer work, no funds, no mm. office, nothing. Uh, and. Um, and then uh, what changed that was uh, in, uh, in the long uh, October weekend in 1970, Paul had been uh, nudging me for a while to, saying, well, you know, you've got to come and see what it's like in the bush. It's, uh, you'll never understand it unless you see that. And uh, so <coughs> I had an old land cruiser we went off to uh, Tumala, uh, we um, and that was my first introduction to what life was like in the bush. But it was we walked into a 
a special situation where the river was in flood, uh, the settlement was on the side of the river and uh, I always remember the old Aboriginal women climbing down slippery clay banks to get a bucket of muddy water out of the river and uh, the manager's cottage uh, was having water truck, clean water trucked into it. So it was a different world. <laughs> oh, absolutely. A different world. But, uh, absolutely. And I, uh, I came back and wrote a letter to the Herald saying, well, you know, I know Aboriginal problems are very difficult, but uh, some are very simple. Uh, and I described this system and the situation on the reserve. And the Herald liked the letter and gave it pride of place. And uh, by 10 o'clock, the state minister had rung me and said, there's a a truckload of water on the way into the settlement. The importance of that occasion was that uh, uh, reporters uh, got interested and came round and said to me, yeah, well, you know, what's the QC doing spending his weekend on an average of reserve? So <laughs> uh, this was a good opportunity to get a bit of publicity for the legal service, and I talked about that. And before the, the morning that came out in the paper, before breakfast, I had a phone call from Bill Wentworth, who was the first Federal Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. And I'd known him in other contexts. And uh, he said, uh, very interested in what you're doing. Uh, I think I can help. Let me know. <laughs> Hung up. He was very, <laughs> never wasted words, Bill. Uh, and uh, so <laughs> I went back and talked to uh, uh, Paul and Gary and Ross and you know the other sort of you know members of the team and uh, so we said well uh, you know obviously this is a, an invitation to ask for some money and uh, the thing that you know these days what's so surprising when you look back is that uh, up till then, it had never occurred to anybody to ask for government money. I mean, but nowadays you'd never think of doing anything without making a submission for funds. But that I, it, it wasn't that we rejected it. It never occurred to us to even do it until uh, uh, Bill uh, uh, made, uh, made that contact. So we put in, asked for funding to open an office in Redfern. Uh, to uh, employ a solicitor who had to be a white bloke because there was no black solicitors and an Aboriginal field officer to uh, be the contact between the lawyers and the people and uh, an Aboriginal secretary in the office. The service really was um, a, a novelty, a breakthrough mm -hmm. organisation. There's so mm -hmm. many community organisations mm -hmm. now. And, uh, the thing that struck me very much was once we got the legal service going, mm. you and Mum Sherl and others, you, you said, oh gee, if we can do this in law, we can do it with health. And you <laughs> went off and got the doctors and set up the medical service. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, and uh, then a whole lot of other things followed from that. But anyway, that we got that, that funding and that was, you, you referred to the fact how when uh, when we uh, rented an office, everybody, black and white, turned out to clean it up and paint the walls, yeah. and we we had a great weekend there. I remember doing it up. Uh, a, a, a lot of people mentioned that weekend to me. I must say that they remember being there. It was mm -hmm. a, a great occasion. And uh, this this idea of having a solicitor there with a notice board, you know this is an Aboriginal service, this is an Aboriginal community service. Uh, was, it, was it really uh, some of the kinds of ideas in your head and other people's heads uh, actually growing out of the ground? There was, I think, that sort of bit of a golden moment there. People got uh, tremendously enthusiastic and, and proud. I think I got the feeling that, uh, you know, when that service got set up and there was the office there and so on. It really gave a, 
a lot of Aboriginals a new sense of pride and self-respect and uh, uh, I thought that, you know, that was one of the, the very important things that came out of it. The feelings that I got was that this was broadening out and everyone involved were, was, was being more conscious about the bigness of the Aboriginal question and uh, I think it's about time we went and had a cup of tea. <laughs> what do you reckon? Okay. When we um, um, got the money available uh, to set up the office and employ some staff, uh, the question arose, of course, of selecting the staff. Now, uh, my point of view on this was uh, uh, partly because I was thinking of it as um, an Aboriginal controlled organisation and partly because I thought our big problem was going to be to get the confidence of uh, Aboriginal people who were in the system, in the courts or the police or the prisons. Uh, it was absolutely essential that the staff we had should be uh, um, acceptable to Aboriginal people. When it, we advertised for a solicitor and um, we had a selection committee meeting. There were, it got down to two main candidates. Um, there was David Collins and uh, there was uh, another chap who went on to uh, uh, be quite uh, prominent in the legal profession afterwards. We had a committee meeting and uh, after the meeting was over, the Aboriginal members came to me and said, look, we can't tell what a bloke's like in a committee meeting like this. Uh, can we take him down the pub? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, that's fine by me if that's what you want. So I put this proposition to the two candidates and, and the one wouldn't go to the pub. Uh, <laughs> only David would go to the pub and so he got the job. Uh, then the, um, uh, for the field officer and the secretary, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that, that was for the Aboriginal people to select uh, and uh, everyone uh, agreed with the field officer it should be Gordon Briscoe. That we, I can't remember any argument about that. Uh, I had met you before, uh, at, uh, you'd been along to council meetings and uh, maybe I've met you otherwise, but I don't remember anything about that, it's a long while ago. But I just remember the fact that uh, there was never any doubt that everyone wanted you to be field officer, so that was fine by me and you became field officer and uh, uh, the same with the secretary. Everyone said Anne Weldon and she was obviously competent and that was fine by me and um, uh, so that's, uh, that's how you came, from my point of view, that's how you came to be field officer. Now, you probably got a different uh, uh, way of looking at it. I didn't feel that I was doing all that well in, in the uh, in the interview, but uh, the very last thing that Hal asked me was, he said, do you have a car? And I said, yeah, I got a little Volkswagen. And, and, and I think that tipped the, tipped the bail. Well, it was certainly a bonus to yeah. have somebody uh, <laughs> with a licence in a car. Yeah. Not, not many Aboriginals had licences, let alone uh, cars. Uh, yeah. True, there's probably only me and Tony Mundine and Redford who had a car. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I talked about, uh, how some of the, uh, the whites involved uh, had distinguished careers, but the same was true on the Aboriginal side. I mean, you, you're going off and, well, you stood for Parliament, but uh, yeah. that was a bit of a... A novelty, but also you went and uh, did your PhD, and uh, uh, and you and Gary Farley have became two leading Aboriginal historians, no doubt. Uh, both, from, both from the service. Uh, Bob Blair, who was there very early on, was the first Aboriginal judge. So, uh, you know, it's been quite a nursery. Uh, we were going in the Aboriginal Legal Service before there was a Racial Discrimination Act before there was any land rights legislation uh, and um, uh, before there were human rights commissions and that sort of thing. Uh, 
um, all those things have, have come come since. 